was different and he was unique and he was turning it upside down. He injected some life into the 80s, I think. <laughs> he's on his own. You know, he's by himself. You know, he's a creator. He's an innovator. He's a, he's a genius. When Prince emerged in the late 1970s, few could have imagined the power he would soon hold in popular music. A unique vocalist, dynamic performer and multi-talented musician, his rise to prominence in the 80s brought vitality and imagination back to a tired scene. This film is a review of his groundbreaking records that defined a decade. The hits that helped him develop from a teenage prodigy to a global superstar. I believe that the 80s were the most critical point in Prince's career because of this confluence of, of the times and the culture and, and what he was doing and what we were doing together as a band. And is he one of the greatest ever? Yeah, absolutely he is. Roger Nelson was born in Minneapolis in 1958. His father, a jazz pianist, exposed Prince to music at an early age. And by high school, he had formed his own band, Grand Central, with his school friend, Andre Simone. Even during these early years, Prince was drawing attention through his skills as a multi-instrumentalist, playing guitar, bass, drums, and piano. He was also a confident vocalist. I didn't know who was the, the, the main star of the group, you know, because everybody was talented. You know, Andre was just as talented as Prince, and, but I all, always noticed Prince always going over to Linda, the keyboard player, and showing her, no, this is what you play, you know, and then she started playing it. So as he was, went back to the guitar, I always go like, you know, looking at him. And then I go like, okay, then we count it off, and then they start playing again, you know. And I says, oh, okay, I'm, you know, seeing where this guy's coming from, you know. He's showing everybody all the... And then he told Andre, no, play this on the bass, you know. And, you know, he'd take the bass from Andre, and he'd play a little bit, and Andre said, yeah, okay. And then uh, he'd give the bass back to Andre, and Andre would just go and play it. I mean, like that, like nothing. And I was going like, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? Who's, you know, who's the talent up in here, you know? He was sort of a, what we would call an urban legend in the Minneapolis area. You know, there were these hushed conversations about this, you know, 16-year-old kid who was the next Stevie Wonder and played all these multiple instruments. By 1976, Prince had abandoned Grand Central and had begun working with Minneapolis studio owner Chris Moon. Despite the strength of some of these tracks, which Prince would later develop in his solo career, they struggled to get noticed until a demo was sent to aspiring manager Owen Husney. I kind of have a little meter in my brain and there's a lot of music that sounds like it should be a hit, that it could be a hit, that it's promising, but at the end of the day, it really isn't a hit. Well, the little meter in my mind, when I, after hearing the second song, the meter went like all the way over to the other end of the scale. And uh, I just thought, this group is phenomenal. So I said to Chris, um, who's the group? This is, this is pretty phenomenal because the guitar player was great, the drummer was right on, uh, the drummer was working with the bass player to create an, an incredible rhythm section, and then there was keyboards on top of them, and the vocals were over the top great. And I just said, who's the group? He said, well, I'd like it if you sat down. I said, you know, and I was Mr. Big Shot, you know, back of those days. And, and I said, I don't sit down. I'm sorry. You, you tell me who the group is. And he said, well, just sit. I said, no, just tell me who the group is. So he says, well, it's one kid. He's 17. He's playing everything. He wrote everything. And he's singing everything. And I just sat down immediately. <laughs> Husney marketed Prince as a prodigy, a young Stevie Wonder, and he managed to gain the interest of several major record labels. 
By June 1977, Prince had signed to Warner Brothers with a six-figure contract. Yet although Warners had big plans for their young signing, Prince quickly made it known that he would remain in sole control of his output. Warner Brothers came to us and said, oh, we've got a great thing. I think we can get Maurice White from Earth, Wind and Fire to produce your first album. Isn't that great? And Prince and I walked out of the room and he said, nobody's producing my first album. And I'm like his manager and already I'm ahead of Prince. I'm thinking, gee, I have to tell one of the biggest record labels in the world that somebody 17 who's never made an album before is going to produce his own album and that's that's going to be it. The music industry into which Prince surfaced in the late 1970s was going through a radical evolution. Whereas the fading stars of the 60s counterculture had dominated the first half of the decade, the emergence of punk and disco had once again democratised the industry and represented new cultures and a new ideology. Yet by the time that Prince's debut For You was released, the scene was transforming once again and he failed to make an impact in this changing world. It would not be long, however, before he found an audience. We have two things that are going downhill. We have disco, which is doing a swan dive, and we have punk, which is evolving into new wave, or has evolved into new wave, and is about to evolve into the new romantics, which is a totally different thing. In Britain, there was the whole two-tone sound, which didn't export to the United States. So, we have a temporary cessation of normal service, both on the rhythm and blues and the rock front. And there is a window of opportunity for somebody new to come in. And he takes it. Released in August 1979, the single I Wanna Be Your Lover provided Prince with his first of many hits, reaching number 11 on the US pop charts and hitting the top spot on the soul chart. In Prince's career, which now extends nearly 30 years, he has always had a great sound, but at the two ends, he hasn't always had great songs. But I Want to Be Your Lover was a great song. And it combined two strengths. One was the vocal range, and he was highlighting the falsetto in a way that we'd recently lost when Smokey Robinson stopped having regular hits. So we needed another falsetto or male soprano voice in the chart. But also, he had the funk. He had the funk like the 70s funksters, like uh, George Clinton and uh, Funkadelic and the people from James Brown's group. So he combined those elements. I Want to Be Your Lover was just one of the songs we cut. But it, w it had a great rhythm feel, and uh, the tempo was right. And so I knew it was going to be a little bit of a rocker. And of course, I was into that, and uh, still am. We just created it along with the rest of them, and uh, it really didn't come together until we put the drums on the track. He just basically came in and, and started playing with this pocket. And we call them pockets, you know, like it's, you know, you set a drum feel, you know, like with a drum machine, they're kind of hard to play to anyway, because they're usually right on the meter. But he basically made that change, you know, in your mind as you heard him play. He was, he was very laid back and very synchronous to a strict meter. I thought that was really impressive that he could do that at that age and, and rock it like that, you know. And he did, you know, being able to basically fit himself into that track, knowing exactly what would come up, what, where. And he had the arrangement in his head as well. So um, to me, I thought that was probably the most, the deepest part of his musical ability was, was to be able to do that and do it so well. Everything he did had groove. I mean, you could tell a Prince piece when you heard it. The timing, 
he had signature timing licks but it was those types of hooks and licks rhythmically that made a huge difference there's no question in my mind that would have been the single and it, and it was even at this early stage, Prince managed to imbue his music with an eroticism and sexuality that would become a more prominent feature of his later work. Right from the word go, he was a very, shall we say, erotically charged performer, even when he wasn't being blatantly sexual. When he sings, I want to be your lover, in that high voice, the instruments go, dun -dun -dun -dun, and it's, it's a pattern which almost represents some sort of sexual excitement. In other words, the instruments sound like he's being your lover. It's a total union of vocal and instrumental. And uh, it was, to use the American expression, horny for the time. Despite rarely discussing his musical influences, Prince's tight funk grooves and stage performances immediately drew comparisons with James Brown. Yet, although he was reluctant to acknowledge them, Prince was inspired by a far more diverse range of artists. I could hear shades of the Isley Brothers, Earth, Wind and Fire, um, uh, Hendrix, if you may, Sly and the Family Stone. But there was one guy um, that everybody kind of looked up to in Minneapolis in particular, and uh, Prince idolized this one person, and he later on played with Prince for a long time, uh, Sonny Thompson. As far as instruments is concerned, this guy is a monster. If Prince idolizes him, okay <laughs> then you know that this guy is great you know he is great I mean he plays all the instruments also there was a, a sense in which you know he was he was kind of recreating the music he had grown up with you know and and working in a style that I think both came naturally to him and was something the the, the record industry could could recognize and let him do but if Prince had continued doing that yeah, I think he would have been a kind of second tier, um, you know, kind of artist that you might include on, you know, the great R&B ballads of the 1980s, you know, rather than somebody who essentially defined the music of the 1980s. Having previously formed a backing band to translate his music to the live arena, Prince re-enlisted them to help him promote his second album. Although he chose to perform numerous roles in the studio, he knew that as a live act he'd need dynamic and diverse players to assist him. And thus the revolution was born. Well, Prince chose a diverse group of people because he really believed that that was imperative for, what, for his vision, for what he was trying to achieve musically and visually and everything else. And again, because he also believed in, in sort of mixing musical influences, that it was important to mix ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds as well. He was obviously creating his own style, you know, in, in, in something like that. It was an amalgamation of all sorts of stuff, you know the different people in the band that was sliced down, you know, sliced the family down, men, women, black, white, you know, so a lot of that came from there. Bullets start chasing, I begin to stop, we begin to wrestle, I was on the top, I His main purpose was so he wasn't stuck in one genre he wanted to be able to cross over and cross racial barriers and I think he did it well he was very very savvy even at an early age and he knew he had to differentiate himself and the band in specific ways and one of the earliest conversations I remember having with him right after I had been you know 
brought into the fold into the band was that he wanted everybody in the band to have a distinct image and that that what he was going to do was in his words portray pure sexuality and i think that that's something that over time you know he understood that that was kind of what brought him to the party and he's been real consistent with that i can remember when prince was tired of the costumes that i was coming up with and he sent his girlfriend down to the uh, to the hotel room I was in and she knocked on the door and she sweetly came in and dumped this bag of metallic multicolored underwear on my on my bed bra and panties basically and said princess wear this or you're fired and I looked at her and I said, you got to be kidding. She says, no, he's not. Yes, there was a point to all that. And it was definitely the image of, of uh, we got it going on. And it's really cool to be like us, no matter what you think of us. All great artists throughout time and in, in pop history have at one time or another done something to call attention to themselves whether you know the elvis presley with his long sideburns and i can remember watching that and going oh no he's gone too far he's then he was swinging his hips on the ed sullivan show the second ed sullivan show they wouldn't show anything uh you know below his stomach because it was way too suggestive to swing your hips and i thought well he's gone way too far at that time you need something if you're truly great you use an attention getting device and then what happens is then people pay attention to you and if you're really good they're gonna buy your music one of the things Prince did ask us to do was if you're gonna wander around the hotel you're not gonna wander around like your granola queen or you're in your t-shirts and Berkey stocks you gotta you've got to dress the part of a rock star and I'd walk downstairs and I'd be in my spandex metallic colored pants and my body tough shirts and my boots and I'd go order coffee and have breakfast <laughs> and I felt stupid as hell but you know after a while I got used to people staring at me and realized you know it's all part of it's all part of what this is and it's okay he's a full-on rock star he lives the life he is you know he is what you see is what you get you know, he's a pop star, rock star, whatever you want to say, but it is, it, it's, it is that life. You know, you, he is the character that you see. That character was becoming more developed on the next release. On Dirty Mind, the track and the album, Prince presented a more overtly sexual persona and a more original sound. And although it found little favour with the public, the music press were quick to identify the emergence of an increasingly unique and challenging artist. Regarding the song Dirty Mind, and really, I, I, in making that comment, I have to say it in context with the whole album, it was not a huge hit, but it was the, the sort of tipping point in terms of this huge critical response, this tidal wave of critical acclaim coming his way. Um, at a time when the record company, you know, understandably, was very nervous about this sudden change. We signed Stevie Wonder and, and now we've got, you know, Rick Ocasek or something here. What happened? So that, that song, I think, was, again, it represented a significant tipping point in terms of Rolling Stone coming out with this glow-in-the-dark review and so on. And, and that was one of the things that enabled him to kind of continue on toward the commercial success. Around the time that Dirty Mind came out, I was living in Atlanta, and I, I, w I wanted to see Prince was playing a club in town, and there was something, I was either out of town during the day, or I was, there was something else I could not get out of, and I couldn't get to the show, and I just went down that night, and it was like, the club was like the club in a cartoon, where the whole place is just shaking, like it just seemed like it was bouncing, I couldn't believe it, I'm standing outside on the street, you know, and Prince, I think, was playing Dirty Mind. You know, that, that riff was just, like, propulsive. You know, and, you know, that's what, it, that's what it felt like, too, when you heard it. It was just completely galvanizing. And, you know, what a shot. 
to the you know to the kind of music industry. I mean, there was a sense in which, you know, well, what's new? I mean, things were really pretty slow in the early '80s, uh, music-wise. You know, apart from Michael Jackson, and then suddenly, you know, Dirty Mind just ignited things. It was it was so compelling, just brilliant. The main keyboard riff in Dirty Mind was actually something that that Matt had played, that had kind of been developed in uh, you know one of our <laughs> numerous endless jams in rehearsal. And again, that was kind of an example of how things, the the approach that Prince took to creating and and and, and expanding his 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 universe and, and pushing the envelope, just had to do with drawing influences from wherever. The thing was great about Prince was that he was such a mixture of different kinds of music. It was funk and um, jazz came in later, but there was probably hints of it here and there um, at that time. But it was also raw, very influenced by the punk scene. You know, he really loved the Clash, and you know, so there was this whole kind of energy that was so opposite from anything else that had been going on at that time. In a certain sense, you know, lyrics have gone so far, particularly in hip-hop, that, you know, it, it might make, you know, somebody just looking at a lyric sheet of Dirty Mind just wonder, well, what's the big deal, a song called Head? You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> that's an element in every hip-hop song now. But Prince's intensity about it, there was something that was very liberating. I think in a lot of hip-hop, it just retreads almost like a lot of conservative aspects about sex, particularly between men and women. Whereas in Prince, there was really this kind of sense of who's on top and who's doing what. It was a statement. It really was. And I think, you know, um, a very powerful one. And maybe one that, um, you know, once the AIDS epidemic became clear, it might have been impossible to make that statement after that. But it was like almost the last moment in which that sense of, you know, hey, it's all out there. Yeah take it if you want it you know that was you know that was part of the fun of what dirty mind was about i think that prince really felt when dirty mind was complete that it was his most honest record to date and and the one that most represented what he was really out to accomplish when he started the record he really believed in that record and he really believed that that was who he was and that was where he wanted to go and that was his future and he was right as challenging as his sexually risque lyrics was Prince's image itself, which had evolved into something far more provocative and ambiguous. This is not conventional garb for any sexual stereotype. He's not trying to look like a woman, otherwise he wouldn't be wearing a trench coat. On the other hand, he's not trying to look like a man, because he wouldn't be wearing bikini briefs. It fits right in with this, I'm not a woman, I'm not a man, am I straight or gay? In other words, he is building a personal mythology. He is constructing an image of the pansexual creature, which is very brave uh, on the one hand, but it surely is commercial, because no other major star had been that out there. In October 1981, the follow-up to Dirty Mind controversy was released. Although this more rock-orientated album had critics hailing Prince as a natural successor to Hendrix, the sales were again disappointing. It was with the release of the first single for his fifth album, however, that Prince finally broke into the mainstream. 1999 exploded onto the charts in September 1982 and over time it would become regarded as one of the key singles of the decade. 1999 was an immediate explosion in the United States, not in Britain, but you had three big hits in the States and the first was 1999, which is a tremendously exciting record. I don't have to tell anybody. It was the theme of a millennium. How bigger can you get than that? I think people, you know, 1999, uh, you know, people were beginning to become aware about the end of the century, sort of around that time. And Prince made it seem, you know, it's kind of apocalyptic, but also a lot of fun. That's something he began doing, I think, particularly well. Being able to weave in his sexual themes, even weave in his spiritual themes, 
uh, weaving his social themes, but also kind of make a party record. You know, and that's what 1999 finally is in a lot of ways. Yet the record owed much of his success to the exposure that Prince had received on the increasingly influential music channel MTV. The single had originally stalled outside of the top 40, and it was the screening of its accompanying music video that eventually propelled Prince back into the charts and into the homes of middle America. I mean, Prince has an extraordinary visual sense. I mean, this is a guy who believes in videos and believes in, vi in visuals. So, you know, the marriage of Prince and MTV was definitely made in heaven. You know, they both took that to the bank. You know, it, it gave Prince a big, big audience and, you know, made MTV feel edgy and heavy. Life is just a party and party was meant to last Prior to that, MTV never had urban artists on and at the point where Michael Jackson with Beat It was on and then we were on with, with the whole uh, 1999 Little Red Corvette thing, all that changed. So to speak to the issue of the songs, all of those things came into play and because of this perfect storm, the songs had a, a, a sort of a runway to land on in the public perception that no Prince record before that it had. Prince had started working on this new material back in April 1982. Unlike on his previous records, the majority of the recordings had taken place at the prestigious Sunset Sound Studios in Los Angeles. Here, he embraced new technologies and managed to create a far more sophisticated end product, while still maintaining control of nearly every aspect of the recording. He would start a song in the beginning of the day, whether it be in the morning or whenever we started. And that very rarely did we come back to a song. We finished it that day. And in that time, that was pretty much unheard of, and I think still unheard of. I mean, sometimes he would overdub. I think Purple Rain was the first one that he really kind of started bringing people in and started overdubbing a lot more. Before, it was just him, and he did everything. He worked around the clock. He had so much energy and so much creative. Just It just flowed from him. Songs would just come out of him. That was amazing. There were two elements, I think, that in the early days became very synonymous with his sound. One of them is the, the Oberheim eight-voice analog synthesizer, which was used in the same way that, that horns were used on Earth, Wind and Fire records or Parliament Funkadelic records. The other, a little bit later on, was the, the Lindrum, the drum machine. And honestly, I think part of it was the sound of it, but another part of it was for him, as someone who had always been a one-man band, and even in working with people, it was very important for the band to execute the sounds that he had in his head, to execute that original moment of creativity where he heard, inspirationally heard that sound in his head. The, the drum machine would do exactly what he told it to do. And for a lot of us in that era, that, that was like a revelation. Wow, I can actually program this machine and it will play exactly what I want it to. Whereas if I try to explain to a drummer what it is I'm trying to do, he's probably going to play my idea his way and it's not going to be the same thing. The success of the single and the exposure that MTV had brought Prince benefited the album enormously. The 1999 LP was the biggest selling record that Prince had so far released, and by the close of 1983, it had sold over a million copies in the US alone. The 1999 album was the seismic shift where all of the things that, that were attempted, and all of the things that were pointed toward through the, the records that preceded it came together in this sort of perfect storm and the, the, the sudden magic formula for being edgy and, and being on, on the bleeding edge, um, but at the same time being commercial and having huge radio hits, all came together at the same time. 1999 is an album that was made for 80s radio. You know, I mean, I think if you go back and listen to Dirty Mind, for example, you know, those songs really sound strange. There's so much space in them 
you know, there's a kind of emptiness that's really intriguing in them. But they're not big radio songs. The songs on 1999 are perfect for radio. There's something going on all the time. You know, Prince had learned a lot as a producer, learned a lot as so he could shape his own music, and I think understood what it would take to to bring him a bigger audience. So, you know, if you listen to Little Red Corvette, you know, certainly if you listen to 1999, you know, you just kind of hear that, you know, big, bright sound of the 1980s. You know, he was one of the guys who defined it. There were dimensions to his writing that were beginning to reveal themselves that I don't think had been there before. The songs were a little more sophisticated, um, not just lyrically, but musically. I mean, when you, when you think of Little Red Corvette, it's just a classic pop song. Which is, was, and always will be, to me, the horniest song ever, ever done. And talk about slipping subject matter past the censors when he was talking about she had a pocket full of horses, Trojans, some of them used. Now, the imagery is fantastic. Everyone's familiar with the Trojan horse. What a lot of people in Britain aren't aware of, which was the number one condom in America at that time, was called Trojans. So to get past the radio censors, he used the image of the Trojan horse rather than saying condom. And then the disgusting line, some of them used. Bolstered by his newfound fame, Prince surprised many by following 1999 with a feature film project. Yet the semi-autobiographical Purple Rain, which he both co-wrote and starred in, proved that he had finally hit his stride. An ambitious spectacle, it was the perfect vehicle for Prince the Performer and Prince the Musician, and the soundtrack sold over a million copies within days of its release. It was almost as if he had an epiphany at that point. It was wild. And it was just this whole thing that just came out of nowhere, and it was just a genius. Total genius. Rock and roll and Hollywood coming together. Both the album and the movie, Purple Rain, just are probably you know, certainly Prince's commercial peak, and in many ways a very serious uh, artistic peak as well. The summer of 1984, when all that was happening, you know, that was Prince's summer. You know, he owned it. When Doves Cry was the first single to be released from the Purple Rain album, and marked Prince's first US number one hit in the summer of 1984. It remained on the top spot for five consecutive weeks and sold over two million copies. In the UK, it was a breakthrough single, the first of Prince's records to enter into the top ten, and it would pave the way for continued success in Europe throughout the decade. I remember when he did it, it was a normal song. It was a beautiful song, but it was a normal song, and he looked over on the final passes of the mix and took the bass out. And he said, nobody's going to believe this. And it was true, nobody could believe it. And it became a huge hit. Everybody loved that song. Um, my, sister, my sister called me up and said, I love this song. It's like, oh, God. And people really did sit up and take notice. He was different, and he was unique, and he was turning it upside down on what was you know, normal in this business. I, I appreciated him in that way. He, he injected some life into the 80s, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I did have an ear for a hook in those days, and it was like the keyboard that dink, 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 and it was like, that's a hit. <laughs> I didn't have to hear a bass. I didn't have to hear anything else. I didn't care if he was singing about birds or singing to the birds. None of it mattered. The keyboard part was a hit. <laughs> Dove's Cry was just, it just 
raced up the charts. I mean, you hear that's a cliche, but it, it's it's just astounding how that record. I, I think of certain records in my lifetime where the day they went to radio, my phone lit up because all my friends called and said, have you heard Cold Sweat by James Brown? Have you heard What's Going On by Marvin Gaye? Well, it was, have you heard this Dove song by Prince? It was on that level of impact. Just right out of the box, it was just like, oh my God. It was like every local band in the world had to go back to the woodshed and start rehearsing again because the vocabulary had changed. It was like how you did music in the 80s had changed overnight. Once you heard that song, everything you did was updated. It's not often that you get lyrics on a number one hit, like uh, maybe I'm just like my father, too bold. Maybe you're just like my mother, she can't be satisfied. You know, this idea of somebody talking about you know, this kind of edible drama in their lives, which is you know, an element in in all of the threesomes in Prince and, and, and in Purple Rain. And it was something that I think, you know, is really there. And in all of its erotic charge too, you know, animal strike, curious poses, they feel the heat, the heat between me and you. I mean, that's, that's a really interesting line. It's like all of nature is kind of responding to this tension here between us. And then, you know, you get the mother and father business thrown in. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's raw stuff. Prince's second single off Purple Rain, Let's Go Crazy, also hit the number one spot in the US. Credited for the first time to Prince and the Revolution, it would become a perennial concert favorite. Let's go crazy, with or without the, the sermon at the beginning. But I love the sermon at the beginning. It's wacky. Everything that Prince does sounds like it's coming from a unique perspective. And that's what made him so distinctive. It could only have been him. So when you call up that shrink, it's Beverly Hills. You know the one. Let's Go Crazy, I thought, was the quintessential, like, opening song. I think he'd managed for the first time in his career to write a, a, a signature song that every time somebody bought a, a ticket to a Prince show, the thing that was going to come to mind is, man, I hope they play that song first. And it was also, obviously, a very memorable moment in the film. That element of just, like, let's just jump on the bikes and go, you know? Um, that's what Let's Go Crazy is about, you know? Let's just go to the club and have a good time. One of the final songs Prince recorded for the album and the third single to be released was the title track, Purple Rain. This power ballad, credited again to Prince and the Revolution, reached number eight in the UK charts and number two in the US. Believe me, you don't usually want to spend eight and a half minutes of your life listening to anything. American Pie, okay, Don McLean, great. A couple of things, but not too many. That's a big investment of your life, but Purple Rain deserves it. Purple Rain, we actually used a remote truck and recorded it. He was doing a live concert benefit for a dance company in Minneapolis, and we recorded it live with a remote truck, and it was the first time he used Wendy and Lisa together. He did all those songs were brand new. Nobody had heard them before. Purple Rain, Let's Go, uh, Let's Go Crazy, I Would Die For You. All those songs nobody had heard. So nobody really applauded after, the, after each song. And it was very strange because they, they, it was new. You know, people don't, it takes familiarity sometimes. But Purple Rain was a live recording in First Avenue. The kind of level of emotional honesty and nakedness in Purple Rain is something that I think is often overlooked. You know, this kind of sense of, of injuring someone and just really wishing that you weren't doing it as you're doing it. This, this wishing for a place, you know, the Purple Rain that, that could just wash all that away. 
somehow and get at allow you to have the connection without the pain it's deep you know i remember when i was going through a divorce one time and just listening to that song i was i just started crying in a in a very indirect but very profound way i think he gets at those kinds of emotions of you know what what went wrong here there's no way to make it better i know i may even be at fault you know but can't something just save us from this and you know that that kind of soaring quality at the end of the song when he sings in that falsetto vocal and he's playing this just astonishing guitar part it's just let's go to another world let's get to a place where we can get beyond all this somehow that's what purple rain is about because prince can look like i mean almost cartoonish sometimes you know people don't associate him with that that kind of emotional seriousness but he can go there man i mean he certainly went there in that song and it, and you know it's hard to find other songs that get at feelings that complicated um that powerfully while just not missing anything the song purple rain for me is his masterpiece in terms of marrying commerciality and emotion it's one of those songs that um, when you hear it, you remember where you were the first time you heard it. You know what I mean? It, it causes your your endorphins and the serotonin to be released in your brain. And again, it was a real step forward for him in terms of his evolution as a commercial artist, but yet a distinct artist. You know that it's him, but at the same time, it's a classic song that, you know, you'll hear it 20 years from now, it'll still be classic. The album and the film solidified Prince's position as a global phenomenon. Whereas at one time his appeal had been considered relatively limited, he had now proven that he could attract a mass audience and his potential for influencing mainstream tastes and popular culture itself began to be realized. He embodied a change in, in our culture that in retrospect seems like it was inevitable but he was riding that wave before a lot of us recognized it coming and i think that's really what it boiled down to was like listen we all have cable tvs now and we all listen to more than one radio station and anybody with any sense is opening their minds and opening their eyes and ears and recognizing that um, there's a bigger world in my neighborhood whatever neighborhood that might be rich poor white black who cares what the world is bigger than your neighborhood and he just simply embodied that and kind of led people along with him no matter what their background was um, just based on the promise that I'm not going to turn my back on you because it's all about all the music and everybody's welcome and in fact we're not going to fight we're going to get along here and I think that was part of the magic of the Purple Rain thing because I think Purple Rain became the extension of that politic he would go away and then I would work with other people and they'd say, oh, you work with Prince, oh, he's this or he's that or he's, you know, he'll be gone tomorrow or whatever. But I had really respected musicians coming up to me and saying, he is a genius. And I thought, yeah, they, they get it. They understand. Because I, I loved his music. I really did. I loved his music. And I know that a lot of people criticized it and tried to dismiss him. And... Um, and then with Purple Rain, they couldn't dismiss him anymore. He was there, and he was there to stay. With his reputation now established, Prince further strengthened his control over both his output and his finances by founding Paisley Park Records. Although this venture allowed him to work with other artists such as Sheila E., Taja Savelle and George Clinton, its greatest chart successes were Prince's own records, and the first of these was released in April 1985. The album, Around the World in a Day, was a marked departure from Purple Rain, and its first single, Raspberry Beret, continued Prince's string of hits. Raspberry Beret, one of the little known facts is that that song was written while I was still in the band, and I have very, very clear memories of being in the back of the tour bus, you know, with guitars and these little portable guitar amps, you know, working the chord changes and, and the vocals and, and, and the, the elements of that song out while we were touring. So that song for me kind of has a special place because I was there in its early stages. I was there in the prototype stage and to hear the, the final version and to see it be, again, one of those hits that's very much connected with him as an icon, that, that's kind of a cool thing. Playing 
working with Prince when we were recording, we got to experiment. And a lot of times he would take the first take, even though there were maybe mistakes that we thought. He said, no, he wants the feeling. He, there was something about the first emotion that he wanted, or your first impression of the song that he wanted. And he'd mix into it. And you go, oh, because when you'd be doing it, you go, oh, I know I can do it better. Let me perfect it. Because in that era, everybody was kind of doing the sterile music where you do 20 takes of one thing, and he didn't work like that. And there's beautiful melodies like Raspberry Beret that you don't realize how intricate those chord changes are till you hear him sit down playing on the piano. It's, and nothing compares to you. I mean, those are really intricate orchestral songs compared to the basic funk music that he did in the beginning like controversy and you know dance music sex romance i mean those are it's quite a different style yeah he's like i said got a lot of personalities the personality that prince decided to reveal on around the world in a day had one foot in the past Whereas with 1999 and Purple Rain, Prince had been forging forward with technology to produce an original and very modern sound. With this album, he paid homage to the innovators of the 1960s, and in particular, the Beatles. I think he, he, he had a lot of respect for, for music that, you know, the British invasion and things that came from the 60s. That was, if there's anything that made him humble, that might have been the one thing. There was communication between Prince and, and Rolling Stone for a while. And at one point he asked for a, a bunch of back issues and he wanted all the Beatles covers and all of Joni Mitchell's uh, major stories and, and covers. And it was it's interesting that there was this kind of 60s fascination on his part since he was seen as such a new artist. Prince says he was a great fan of Joni Mitchell and he would love Joni's lyricism, her vocal uniqueness and her silences. The Duna Flying Ninjas is a song so wild and blue It scrambles time and seasons if it gets through to you Then your life becomes a travel line I think that's one of the most encouraging examples of an artist citing an influence that wasn't obvious that I've ever heard. Despite these influences and very healthy sales, the album was regarded as a disappointment after the revelation of Purple Rain. I thought Around the World in the Day was really a transitional record. It, it was important to Prince that he not do anything that's overtly redundant of Purple Rain. And I think if there was a theme to Around the World in a Day, it was that it's the anti-Purple Rain record. You know, it's easy to note the Beatles' influence, particularly in things like Raspberry Beret. But I don't want to say it was contrived, but it was a record that had an agenda, if only because it was determined to do something dramatically different so that he couldn't be accused of riding the crest of Purple Rain. It was evoking an era where he hadn't been, and he didn't do it as well enough as the people who'd been there to begin with. I think that's the safest thing to say. So thank God for Raspberry Beret, which was good and was a hit. Prince returned to the silver screen the following year with Under the Cherry Moon, which he also directed. Unlike Purple Rain, however, the film was dismissed by critics and ignored by audiences and failed to break even at the box office. Yet with its soundtrack album Parade, Prince returned to his funk roots on several tracks, and although the record again showed a decline in sales, the single Kiss would supply him with yet another US number one. By the time Parade and Under the Cherry Moon came around, he was quite successful. He had made millions and millions, and um, I think he just wanted to pursue a movie career, and he wanted to do a soundtrack. Most of that record is geared as a soundtrack for the film. The song Kiss came about totally accidentally. I mean, I was doing a group called Maserati in one room, 
at Sunset Sound, and he was in the other room completing that soundtrack record. And he gave us this song on acoustic guitar called Kiss, and we tried to turn it into something and sat up all night trying to figure out what to do with it. We made the track, and the next morning I came back about 9.30, and he had already come in, and I said, where's my tape? And he said, uh, eh, it's too good for you guys. I'm taking it back. <laughs> so he had already put his voice on it. He already put his guitar on it. Bam. And then there was a bass part on it. Didn't You know, he removed a lot of the stuff that was on there. This was the first song that I was going to be credited other than just an engineer. And he also renamed me David Z because that wasn't my name on the first four records. So, um, you know, I, I was sort of speechless, but then I talked to the, one of the people at Warner Brothers on the phone, and they said, oh, no, we, we're not putting that out. We don't like it. And I went, what? It's like, what? And they said, no, it sounds like a demo. There's no bass. There's no reverb. It sounds like a demo. It sounds like we did it in your basement. And I was devastated, and luckily enough, he, like I said, was successful, and he had enough power at the time to say, you put that out first, or I'm not giving you another single. And a year later, they were only trying to sign things that sound like that. So that tells you where the music's supposed to come from. I remember the first time I heard the song Kiss, really feeling that he had managed to recapture some of that sort of raw R&B emotion from some of his earlier music. And even going back to some of the stuff, you know, that, that he had written for the time. But at the same time, again, because he had by now mastered the commercial elements and knew how to be himself but at the same time write hits i just thought that that was a masterful song the sparseness of it the melodic elements of it the soulfulness of the vocal i thought that was a masterful song the, the guitar on kiss the rhythm guitar was gated through a gate to make it synchronize with the hi-hat on the drum machine and nobody can play that it's just a it's a f electronic trick that I mean, I'm just playing open chords and it's doing that rhythm, but, you know, we'd try everything and anything. And, uh, you know, it's, it was very fun and very creative, and there's, when there's no rules like that, you don't have to do what somebody else did. Kiss is the kind of song which is perfect out of news, as they say. In other words, if, if the newsman ends and says, more at seven, or 35 degrees, did it did it did it did it kiss. I mean, it's perfect change of mood change of tempo and you're in the song within five seconds it's so well constructed you see and 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 he uses silence and pauses so wonderfully most people are afraid to leave pauses and silence because they think that uh, people will lose interest in one second but Prince knew that you could use pauses and silence for suspense, for building, for impact. And Kiss is a perfect example of that. Go to your record collection now, listen to it from that point of view, and you'll think, oh yeah, he's using these little pauses, these little silences, and it's all very dramatic, and it's sucking me into the record. It's great. For the tracks on the album that worked like a more conventional musical score, Prince looked outside of his immediate circle for input on the arrangements. The musician he discovered became the first person to contribute to Prince's music without interference. The Parade album introduced another dimension to Prince's MO of album making in that uh, arranger Claire Fisher was a contributor. And it was kind of unique because Claire is somebody who was completely outside the Prince camp, someone that Prince didn't have any overt influence on and in fact hadn't even met face to face. And it was the proverbial case of sending tapes back and forth through the mail and just being interested enough in hearing what he would do left to his own devices. I've recorded pop albums, I've recorded jazz albums, I've recorded Latin albums, and I'm known in a, a whole lot of different categories. And then to suddenly have pop artists come along and want me to write arrangements for them, I said, well, 
I mean, I wasn't averse to it, but I, I, it was a different dimension. The first thing about Prince was, man, he was free. He didn't interfere with what you did. And I thought that was wonderful. Uh, unfortunately, most people don't understand what arranging is. So they think if they've got their recording with a voice and rhythm section and everything, that what they would like to have on is what they would write, only they don't know how to write. So they called me. In later years, Prince would sometimes give him some kind of cryptic instructions. I want this kind of a thing on this track, this on this track. But never too specific because, A, there was an enormous respect for Claire's ability and his own creativity as an artist. And Prince also, I think, had a curiosity to see what he would kind of think. There was, a, there was a part of him that wanted to be surprised by what Claire would do. And, of course, Claire to this day is known for very creative string and sometimes horn arrangements that go against the grain. I mean, this is a guy who marches to his own drummer in his world much the way Prince does. And uh, while he certainly has a personal stamp on everything he does, it's not cookie cutter and it's not going to sound like anybody else's work except Claire Fisher. And uh, in that sense, Claire Fisher and Prince are a perfect match. While Kiss was at number one in the US charts, Prince was also enjoying success through a song given to the all-female group The Bangles. Highlighting his gifts as a pop composer, the track Manic Monday launched the band's career and reached number two on both sides of the Atlantic. We had worked until about, I don't know, it was like three or four in the morning. We were both exhausted and he called the session for probably six in the evening. When we worked that late, he usually called it for six. And I got a call at nine in the morning and said, he's coming in. And I was not too happy. And he knew it when he came in, I was not too happy. And he said, I said, if I dreamed a chorus, I was coming in. And I said, you dream your songs? And he said, yeah, sometimes. And we came in and we cut Manic Monday, start to finish. And that eventually, it went to Vanity Six, but then David Leonard and David Kahn were working on the Bangles and asked him for a song and he gave the Bangles that song and they had a pretty decent hit with that. So that was the song that he had dreamed that morning. <laughs> Just another manic Monday. Wish it was interesting that Prince wrote so well for women. His big hit covers are by women. His range and his attitude suited the female voice. And Manic Monday is a great pop record. This was neither the first nor the last time that other artists had success with Prince's songs. Chaka Khan had major success with a cover version of I Feel For You from his second album. And Scottish singer Sheena Easton had relaunched her career in the mid-1980s with an album co-composed and produced by Prince. It kind of hinted toward his ability to seamlessly kind of move back and forth between R&B and pop and, and rock sensibilities. Sometimes he did not do the best versions of his songs. In addition to all the ones that were hits for him, some of them were good songs, but he himself hadn't made them very commercial. And it took somebody else's arrangement to make them commercial. Of course, the most famous is Nothing Compares to You, which is an all-time classic multi-million seller by Sinead O'Connor, and the original by The Family is poor. now severed most of his ties with the revolution, during 1986 Prince was in a staggeringly prolific creative spell. His follow-up to Parade, a triple album called The Crystal Ball, was to be a 22-track opus incorporating several distinct strands. Yet Warner Brothers were uneasy after the lukewarm reception to the previous two releases and eventually reduced the album to a two-disc set, renamed Sign of the Times. 
It was really a song a day coming out of the studio in his house and later at our rehearsal warehouse where he had gear installed. And it was just any given day you'd show up for work and he'd be playing another new brilliant song. But, I mean, it was, just seemed never ending. Concepts for albums were coming to him almost as quickly as the songs were. It, it kind of documented where he was at as a composer, as an instrumentalist, as a band leader, because the band played on a few tracks on that album, not all of it, but some of it. And, and just about every creative aspect of Prince the Musician was represented and updated with Sign of the Times. The album's title track was released as a single in February 1987 and reached number three in the US charts. Sign of the Times, uh, the, the, the song, seems to me just exactly what it says it is. You know, it's, it's, this, it's Prince kind of scanning the social environment and sort of reporting on what he's seeing. In France, a skinny man died of a big disease with a little name. By chance, his girlfriend came across a needle and soon she did the same. At home, there were 17 year old boys and their idea fun. Is being in a gang called the Disciples High on Crack and toting a machine gun. Prince doesn't often seem to be looking outward. He often seems to be working in his own kind of inner terrain. But to just kind of see him look out in that way in itself was powerful. And then the, sh the song itself kind of doubled that. There's, a, there's an element of seriousness in it that, um, um, that makes a big impact, I think. A lot of times you listen to his song and go, that's weird. And then about the third time you go, oh, wow, I love that. It's, it's not something you can explain. It's a gift that he has. And um, you only wish that a composer could be like that. And you wish all music could be like that, but it's not. Some music grabs you right away. Some music takes a while to warm up to. But that's the kind of stuff you can't let go. I guess it's a deep hook. But that's what's complex about it, is the hooks are buried so deep that it takes you a while to figure it out. Sign of the Times, I thought, was his most creative foray in a long time, the song Sign of the Times. And it managed at once to be totally creative, totally unique, and hooky at the same time, which doesn't happen very often. You know, y you might have to go back to like Gary Newman and Cars before you can kind of come up with something like that. But I really admired that record because it really had me listening to the sounds and the tracks and going, wait, how did he get that? That snare sound is so different. How did he get that? You know, um, which for me, I, I hadn't been struck that way with any of this stuff for a while. Yet alongside this seriousness, there were also classic Prince pop numbers. The track, You Got the Look, a duet with Sheena Easton, would become Prince's biggest US hit since Kiss, reaching number two on the Billboard charts. Despite its commercial appeal, it was still removed from pop conventions, however, and Prince's experiments with sped up and distorted vocals marked it out as something of an anomaly. I was a part of um, a lot of that experimentation. We used to joke that we'd put guitars underwater if we had to. And we did everything from play the bass part in the song on pedals or the organ instead of a bass guitar to obviously slowing down the tape and putting his voice on it. When you speed it up, he sounds like a munchkin singing. And we do that and we do all kinds of things. You Got the Look is a fabulous record. They have this vocal interchange in the middle of the record, which is, is unique. Uh, when he goes, ladies and gentlemen, the World Series of Love. And she goes, oh, please. <laughs> What? It wouldn't have occurred to anyone to put anything like that in a record. But Prince put it in a record, and it was hilarious in the middle of being funky. You know, you got the look. It was just a great kind of rock and track. I mean, in the duet with, with Sheena Easton, you know, it just had this kind of erotic charge to it, you know? Uh, and it was fun. You know, it was just kind of like Prince just cutting loose. and. You know, it's kind of, it's erotic quality and it's 
you know, just a sense. It was just one of those tracks that, you know, it was a great Prince dance track. Prince pushed this dance feel further on his next album, Love Sexy, and in particular its standout single, Alphabet Street. Released in 1988, the record was a spiritual riposte to the dark undertones of the Black Album, which Prince had withdrawn at the end of the previous year. In Europe, dance music and fusions of house and hip-hop had emerged over the previous two years, and Love Sexy fitted well into this new musical culture. In the US, however, sample-based music was still underground, and Prince's more minimal sound failed to ignite the charts. He became a pretty, pretty semi-regular fixture on the, on the club scene in both London and Paris. And that influenced this music that came pouring out of him. I tended to look at Love Sexy as an album that didn't know what it wanted to be. Thank God for Alphabet Street. This is just like with Around the World in a Day and Raspberry Beret. You, you have one great track that saves it and gives him oxygen for another year. Love Sexy uh, isn't one that people go back and listen to. But Alphabet Street is a very poppy, funky song. And of course, has, again, another great beginning. No! no! One of the interesting aspects, uh, one of the interesting trajectories in, uh, in Prince's career is his evolution of ideas about sex. You know, because initially he was embraced as, you know, this kind of sexual liberator. You know, is he white or black? Is he male or female? You know, it's, you know, sort of beyond category. You know, you have that move from the Black Album, which was kind of uh, an extension of all of that kind of, you know, polymorphous, perverse sexuality into love sexy, you know, into love as a kind of spiritual love. You know, that's what's sexual. You know, that's where the erotic charge comes from. That was, I think, that moment, the first moment where he turned away from the kind of wild controversy style sexuality that, that in many ways, uh, you know, brought him this big audience. And I think personally he began to feel uncomfortable with it and then spiritually and, you know, and it certainly um, for a time affected what his music was like. Whereas Prince had led the way as an innovative mainstream artist for the duration of the decade, by the end of the 1980s things were changing. Hip-hop finally began to emerge from the underground in the US and brought with it a culture in which Prince would find no place. Although he would remain a major player, his appeal would become more marginal in the coming decade. After Sign of the Times, he does not have consistent top 40 success. Occasionally a giant record, yes. But he is not in the mainstream. He's in the Prince stream. And once these terrible themes of 1990s hip-hop emerge, he's relegated to the sidelines. Because he's not going to talk about misogyny or homophobia. He's not going to go there. He's not going to talk about gun crime or bling. These are not his subjects. And uh, so one would say, thank heaven for Batman. One of the blockbusters which eventually defined the decade, Tim Burton's Batman film, was both a huge production and a shrewd marketing exercise. Asked to record a track to promote the film, Prince instead delivered an entire album. Dismissed by some on its release as a lacklustre mishmash containing songs that Prince had discarded earlier in the decade and revived for this venture, it nevertheless became one of his most commercially successful albums, selling 11 million copies worldwide. It also provided him with a US number one single, Bat Dance. Now obviously by the very nature of it being a Batman film, and the first in a long time, he's not going to be doing a series of these things, but yeah, let's hang on to this. And Bat Dance is wonderful. I mean, 
I don't even want to know how long it must have taken him to do that. There are so many samples from the soundtrack. There are so many lyrical references to things going on in the movie. It is a very clever assembly, but boy, it's a very skillful one. And especially if you talk about the full-length six-minute track. But it was, that was a very important moment in his career and kept him on top even when the scene was going in a weird direction. Go, go, go with a smile. We have three years of working for Prince that he has just been sending us different songs and we've been adding orchestral backgrounds to them, not knowing really what they were going to be used for. And knowing also that he had a penchant for wanting to sometimes take some of these backgrounds, maybe individual tracks or maybe the entire orchestral background, to separate it from the track that we had done the arrangement for and put it on something else use it as background music for his uh, movie scenes or to put it in a completely different tune and this was the case with Batman and so we didn't even realize we were involved in that until we got a call from the record company saying that they would uh, be sending us a check for the new use of the music I mean Bat Dance as a theme song you know, to the Batman film, you know, there was such a hype about that movie. And it was, you know, the big movie and everybody was excited about it. And it just kind of seemed more exciting that Prince was doing the theme song. I mean, to me, it wasn't really that great a song. You know, I think it was just, you know, it was propelled by, you know, everybody's good feeling. We're going to go to the movies. We're going to have a good time. We're going to, we're going to like it. You know, we want to like it. You know, and it was fun to see Prince doing something that seemed like fun and, it didn't seem all that serious, you know, the bat dance, you know, it, there was a kind of element of, you know, let's just get behind this. As far as, you know, comparing bat dance to Purple Rain as a song, I mean, there's no comparison. I mean, Purple Rain is, is I would say, profound. You know, bat dance is a great theme song to a big summer movie. I think that Prince reached the point that all career artists reach, where just the sheer chronology of it all, you, you will come to some sort of flat spots where sort of the confluence of what's happening in the culture, what's happening in, in, the, the, in the industry, what's happening on radio, whatever the case might be, and where you are and where you've been don't necessarily line up as perfectly as they did during the 1999 era. But I think ultimately, he was the master at being first an artist and being first a persona and a live performer so that the people were coming out, the shows were selling out all through that era, and it all comes back around again. By that time, the end of the 80s, everyone who was remotely interested knew that he was a killer live performer. That he was not a person who just uh, made music to be famous or acted to be famous. This was a guy who lived within music, who spent time voluntarily in the recording studio, made more music than he could release. You are not built to be able to go work at Burger King or McDonald's. You couldn't handle it. You wouldn't know what to do or how to function in that type of a life. And I picked up on that from Prince, that this was the only thing. He was either going to make it huge or he was not going to be around. There's a whole series of black artists, everyone from, you know, Terence Trent Darby to, you know, to Living Color to Lenny Kravitz. In a lot of ways, Prince really kind of broke the path for them. You know, these kind of white artists, uh, I mean, these black artists who were interested in rock and roll and saw that as part of their bag of tricks, you know, Prince broke that ground. So. I mean, Prince was huge. He was a huge, he was not just hugely successful, but he was hugely influential. He's the number one artist on this planet, bar none. Because he's been on the cover of Guitar Magazine, he's been on the cover of Drum Magazine, he's been on the cover of Keyboard Magazine, and he's been on the uh, cover of Bass Magazine. No other artist in the history of this music industry can, can do that, has done it. Guitar. 
In a lot of ways, the music of the 80s was littered with styles that Prince rejected. As soon as he moved on from something, everybody else grabbed it and had the remaining amount of hits you know, left to that sound that because Prince lost interest in it and was on to something else. The, the combination of the element of who and what Prince is as a, a unique and once-in-a-lifetime artist with the, the particular time period and, and the bands that he surrounded himself through that period, I don't know if anybody will ever reproduce that again. We've watched to evolve over the years, not only as a musician, but as a man. And uh, I wonder sometimes when you look back at old material, like I've looked at so much in the last 24 hours to prepare for this, do you look back at old stuff, risque stuff, and, and want to separate yourself from it? Well, you know, when you're 20 years old, you're looking for the ledge. You mm -hmm. know, you want to see how far you can uh, push everything. Mm -hmm. And um, as an artist, I just went there just to find it. And then you make changes. You know, 30 years ago, I, there's a lot of things I don't do now that I did 30 years ago. And there's some things I still do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>